we're going well, the way we're going to do this so that we don't put them all on the spot at once is we'll take two or three questions and then we'll we'll give those to the panelists. So uh, could we start here? We have a uh, please speak into the microphone if you could introduce yourself. Yes, uh, good day everyone. I, I could speak in English and in French if if you don't mind. Um, bonjour, Monsieur, uh, Monsieur le Ministre, son, son uh, honorable. Mon nom c'est Thomas Sama. Je suis Camerounais d'origine, mais je travaille ici en Finlande comme postdoc en sociologie. Donc je suis sociologue. Bon, euh, je, je connais très bien le problème de l'Afrique euh, euh, centrafricaine, tout ce qui se passe là-bas. Et ce que vous avez présenté ici comme la situation de l'éducation est très triste. Donc, ma question, c'est ce que, euh, maintenant qu'il y a la paix là-bas en, euh, en République centrafricaine, qu'est-ce que l'État est en train de faire pour encourager les enfants, les étudiants à étudier? Est-ce que l'école est gratuite? Est-ce que l'État donne le matériel scolaire à toutes les enfants, les étudiants, pour qu'ils aillent à l'école. Parce que si l'école est payante, il y en a beaucoup qui, avec la guerre, n'ont pas l'argent pour um, se scolariser. Okay, let me turn out into English. So, um, I just said my name is Thomas Sama, and uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Helsinki, Faculty of Social Sciences and uh, originally fr uh, from Cameroon, Central African Republic, where the minister is from, is our neighbor, like Finland and Sweden. So I was just asking the minister that, now that the war in Central Africa is over, what is the government doing? And after he presented the very sad situation about the education situation there, that what is the government doing to encourage children, students, to actually go to school? Is the government uh, providing free education? Is, uh, is the government giving school materials to uh, pupils and, and students to go to school? Because I know if education is uh, paid for, and if the children have to buy the, the school material, many children will not be able to go to school. Thank you. My name is Sato Santala and I'm the Director General for the Development Policy Department at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Finland. Um, and thank you for all the panelists for, um, for very enlightening um, and personal um, experiences that you've shared with us today. I'm just wondering about two aspects of education in emergencies and also in situations where people have had to move from where they are and where they naturally would have um, their children go to school. I'm thinking, how would you see the possibilities that um, that modern technologies provide? Um, and um, there was a little bit of discussion about teaching mathematics with games, but do you see um, other, um, how, how far can we go with this? And, and is that the solution for, for many of these challenges? And secondly, how do you see um, do you see that it would be important to include in um, education in these types of very special situations something in the curriculum about tolerance, um, about building um, a more peaceful uh, society, or is that too difficult to do while still in uh, in an emergency situation? Thanks. Oui, merci. Je suis Josias Tebero de la République Centrafricaine. J'ai accompagné mon ministre. Uh, I'm Jobias Tiberio. I'm accompanying my minister. I come from the Republic of Central Africa. Uh, Madame uh, Obu avait donc parlé de la compréhension des systèmes culturels des pays pour mieux préparer les enfants. Uh, ma, uh, uh, Mrs. Johanna has talked about the uh, understanding the cultural differences to understand better the children. Uh, chez nous, à des régions qui 
s'occupe des activités diverses. In our country, we have uh, different uh, regions that uh, are uh, doing with different activities. À des moments précis, il y a des régions qui s'occupent donc des mines. Uh, for example, there are regions that are doing with mines. With Et l'expansion des mines coïncide avec euh, l'ouverture des écoles. This expression has to do with the, with the opening of the schools. Alors les enfants quittent l'école pour aller derrière leurs parents vers les mines. The, the children quit the schools to help the, their parents uh, at the mines. Est-ce que euh, au Népal, est-ce qu'il y a des pareils cas qui se posent et quelles sont les solutions qui ont été envisagées? Is it uh, there is there a similar situation in Nepal? And are do you think there are any solutions to this? Merci. Uh, thank you. You raise a, a good point in that last question, as we can learn from other countries, of course. Um, so we have a couple of, of questions here. Um, the first, uh, very specific, um, to Central African Republic. Um, so, Minister, if I could give it to you. Ouais. Et, merci. Il euh, y, y a deux questions qui se recoupent. Il y a deux questions qui sont interrelated ici. Avec bien sûr des, des réponses différentes. D'abord, pour la technologie, c'est un luxe pour notre pays. So first about technology, it's of course a luxury for our country. À partir du moment où le problème de, de comment vous appelez de l'électricité pose déjà problème. We already have Et problems at the basic level le problème of providing des connexions pose problème même à l'université. Donc c'est pourquoi j'ai dit que c'est un luxe. That's why I'm saying um, it's luxury. Nous dans la situation actuelle, on fait tout pour que dans une école, il y ait un maître, un tableau noir et une craie. Voilà à quel niveau nous nous, nous situons encore pour, pour, voir, pour, pour vous montrer la différence entre chez nous et euh, chez vous. In the current situation in our country, the most essential things we focus on is to have a teacher, a blackboard and something to write on the board. Alors, parler de technologie, c'est vraiment un luxe parce que j'ai visité des écoles hein, ici, j'ai vu que actuellement la Finlande est en train de mettre tous les coups et au niveau du, du pré-scolaire, vous vous imaginez que les cours sont déjà en ligne, plus ou moins. Ça c'est une révolution. So he has visited schools in Finland uh, in the past days and has seen Par rapport how... à nous, bien sûr. Donc il n'y a même pas de comparaison à faire à ce niveau-là. Yeah, and he has um, seen how the digitalization is also happening for contents of, of preschool education. So you can't really compare with the situation contre, in his country. Par contre, la situation des guerres et de conflits uh, nous oblige aujourd'hui à intégrer dans notre curricula la problématique de la paix, de la cohésion sociale, de la tolérance. Tout c est, c est ça, on, est, on, va, on va devenir champion dans <laughs> ces domaines-là. Parce que on a tiré les leçons de, de la crise. But because of the wars we've been going through, um, themes of tolerance and uh, social cohesion and peace have to be integrated into the curricula and we have to become champions in this. Parce qu'il y a le problème de, 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 de tensions intercommunautaires et même religieuses entre musulmans et, et chrétiens et qui a été alimenté par les hommes politiques. And there are a lot of tensions uh, between communities and between uh, different religions, especially Muslims and Christians, that have been fed by politicians. Alors, pour remonter à, la, à, la, à mon ami Thomas, um, um, ce que fait l'État pour encourager um, le, le fonctionnement des établissements scolaires, c'est que nous sommes partis d'une expérience. What uh, the state is doing to try to encourage the action of um, the school system is uh, starting from one experience. Quand il y avait la guerre, tous les enseignants, hein, tous les enseignants, c'est-à-dire permanents, ces enseignants qui ont été formés dans nos écoles, ont abandonné les écoles. 
During the war, all the teachers that have been trained uh, for schools have left schools. Et c'est ce, ce, ce qu'on appelle les maîtres parents. Je crois que Mario connaît bien la situation. Ceux qui ont pris la relève, les maîtres parents, c'est quoi C'est qui And they have been replaced uh, by parents who are acting as teachers. Ce sont de, des hommes comme vous et moi, des parents, qui ont pris la place des, des enseignants pour enseigner les, les, les élèves. It's people like you and me, parents like you and me, who have uh, taken up the role of teachers to teach the children. Et, évidemment, ces maîtres parents-là, n'ayant pas la formation, ils déforment plus qu'ils ne forment. And of course, they are not trained, so instead of training, they are actually distorting. Et nous avons cette catégorie-là. Nous avons cette catégorie-là. Vous voyez comment l'affaire devient compliquée encore. Mais qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire And dans ces this, conditions this very, uh, special category of, of uh, parents acting as teachers, the situation is even more complicated. So ca what can we do in this situation? Nous sommes obligés de les prendre en compte, ces maîtres parents-là, de renforcer leurs capacités. We need to take those people into account uh, and try to um, build, build on their capacities and nous reinforce sommes, capacities. Nous sommes obligés, parce que c'est le phénomène des guerres qui a créé cette catégorie d'enseignants-là. We have to, because wars have created this um, new category of, of teachers. Oh, maintenant, pour la deuxième question, l'école n'est pas payante, elle est gratuite. Elle est gratuite, mais la malgouvernance fait que des, des chefs d'établissement prélèvent de, de, de l'argent. And to answer the second question of Thomas, a school is free uh, in Central African Republic, but the problem is that school directors are um, actually um, misusing some of the money. On a, on a beau interdire cette pratique, mais <laughs> dès que vous avez le dos tourné, c'est fini. Hein? Ça reprend. We try, of course, to prevent it and forbid it, but um, as soon as we turn our backs, then it starts again. Thank you for that and, and for covering a number of questions, uh, Minister. I'd like to um, ask Johanna if she could answer the question around Nepal and are there lessons learned from Nepal about children working? Okay. So uh, I understood from you, you were explaining that in uh, Central African Repu Republic, many children quit school uh, to work in mines. I mean, parents are taking them, them off from the schools. And you were asking from me if I have faced the same situations in Nepal or some other countries. And what they are doing about that. And what they are doing about that, okay. So yes, I have faced this situation many times in Nepal and also in other countries. And, and uh, usually when we start to work with the parents or work with the communities, we first want to know the reason why they are taking their children out of school. And when we uh, continue our discussions, Uh, usually the reason is that the parents think that their children are not learning uh, valuable skills at school. They feel that the quality of education is, is, is too low and, and, and the curriculum at school is not relevant for their children. So they maybe feel that children are not learning those skills, what they should learn, that they are able to earn maybe some money or get employed in the future. So this is the challenge which is related to quality of education. And, and uh, what, what we have been doing, for example, with Finn Church Aid in Nepal, is that we are trying to improve the quality of education Uh, for example, through vocational training components. So when the young people or adolescents are studying at school, at school, um, we, we really want to emphasize those kind, of, those kind of skills which are important for the children, for their future. Uh, with these skills, one day children can maybe earn money, maybe they can go to higher education, But we really want to showcase to parents that this, 
being at school, it's, it's important and valuable to the children. And we really want to uh, enforce the linkage, bit, uh, linkage between learning to earning. So uh, this is something what we are trying to do, for example, in Nepal at the moment. Thank you. Thank you for that. And then Rana, I was wondering if you could, um, part of, or one of the questions was around technology. If you could tell us a bit about uh, the application that you've created in, in, as you're talking to that. Yeah. Actually, it's an uh, uh, idea. I work on it. It's uh, related to my field. Uh, it's uh, a mobile offline application to learn uh, an easy and a smart way. I still work on it, and I, I think it, it could be useful. And the, the technology, uh, I think, best way to, and the, uh, the children enjoy in, in, uh, in this part to learn uh, uh, higher uh, quality uh, education. Um, and I work on it. I hope, I hope it, can, it could be used in the future. Excellent. And the question then around um, tolerance and, and peaceful society, did somebody on the panel? I'm, I'm happy to talk about it, but if somebody else would like to, to mention Please. anything. Please. Minister? Did you want to talk about that? The importance? Hey, concerning the problem of peace and tolerance, it's still lié to the méconnaissance of the history of the country. Uh, the problems related to peace and tolerance are also related to the fact that um, the history of the country is uh, not well known. Le fait de ne pas intégrer un volet ou encore un aspect de l'histoire dans le programme à long terme crée ce genre de situation là, de conflits intercommunautaires, d'incompréhension entre les apprenants et même entre les enseignants. When some aspects of histories are left out of the curricula, then uh, such problems, uh, uh, such as tensions between communities or tensions between even teachers or teacher and students, um, are appearing. For example, for the reasons political, we have tried to oppose the two communities, in l'occurrence, the Muslim and the Christian. For political reasons, uh, we've tried to oppose two communities. Uh, the Christians and the Muslim. Oh, l'histoire de notre pays a montré que dans les années 1800, et là je me suis avant même la colonisation, le territoire de la RCA, du Tchad et du Congo était confondu. Et particulièrement pour la RCA, on parlait de Lubangi Shari Tchad. But in history, uh, even before coloni colonization, before um, in the years 1800, uh, the territories of Chad, Cameroon, and uh, Central African Republic were uh, together. And this territory uh, was called as a whole, um, can you repeat, Ubangi Shari? Ubangi Shari, Ubangi Shari. Chad. 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 Chad and Central Africa were confused in a territory, unique. So this was all one, one and the same territory before colonization, and then under and then under a French colonial period. Et à l'époque, il y avait déjà des sultanats, des sultanats qui s'étaient installés. And at the time, there were already sultans that had um, um, settled down in the region. Et qui avaient construit des cités basées sur le modèle Islamic du Nord, par exemple, des États du Nord, notamment l'Empire du Gao, l'Empire du Kachina, au Nigeria, Kano, etc. And the sultans had built cities on uh, models um, in the north, in um, can you repeat me which place? In Nigeria, Nigeria, and Mali, Mali, hmm. and so on. Ça, c'est des choses qui sont connues. C'est des choses qui sont connues. These facts are known. Et à l'époque, il y avait même une capitale hein, calquée sur ce modèle-là qui était, qui s'est situé dans le nord. Si j'avais la carte, j'allais vous montrer, c'est au nord, avec le nom de Shah. Il y a déjà une capitale. 
And at the time, there was even a capital that was uh, built around this model in the north of the country called Et Shar. Ce qui ont amené cette civilisation là, islam, euh, arabo-islamique, ce que j'appelle arabo-islamique, ce sont des autochtones et non des étrangers, comme les hommes politiques le montrent aujourd'hui. And the ones who have brought this uh, Arab uh, Islamic civilizations are not people who came from abroad, but they were local people. Ce sont des habitants du nord qu'on appelle le Runga Bagirmi. C'est eux qui ont qui sont les vecteurs de cette civilisation. It's people who en have inhabited the north uh, who have brought uh, this civilization and they are called. Or aujourd'hui, le Runga Bagirmi. The Runga Bagirmi. Alors les hommes. <laughs> J'ai l'ouvrage qui, qui est même en ligne hein, que vous pouvez consulter parce que ça fait un ouvrage de 276 pages que j'ai écrit ouais, et qui est publié. Il a écrit publication on, on the topic that's online and you can um, check it out if you like. Qui est publié dans les éditions et dix livres en France. It's published by a, a French um, a publisher. Alors aujourd'hui, les hommes politiques développent l'idée que la religion musulmane et amené par des étrangers. And today politicians uh, want to uh, spread the idea that um, uh, the religion of Muslims has been brought by, by people Et quand on dit étranger, c'est Camerounais, Tchadien, Nigérian, Malien, Sénégalais, etc. So by um, people from the neighboring countries like Cameroon, Chad, uh, Mali, etc. Alors, c'est pourquoi j'ai dit que c'est encore lié à l'éducation, c'est lié à la culture. Quelqu'un qui ne connaît même pas l'histoire de son pays, il croit facilement. And that and that's why it's related directly to history and culture and education because someone who doesn't know this uh, will believe politicians. Et dans ce contexte, c'est facile d'opposer les gens. And it's very easy to d'opposer um, musulmans, chrétiens, etc. It's very easy to create a divide and to um, have Muslims and Christians oppose each other. C'est pourquoi aujourd'hui, nous nous efforçons dans nos programmes d'inclure les aspects euh, enfin, ces aspects-là historiques, problème de tolérance, problème de civisme, problème de paix, de cohésion sociale, etc., etc. And that's why we really focus uh, nowadays in our uh, curricula on including these aspects of tolerance, peace, and social cohesion. Mais le problème, c'est que il faut il faut toucher les 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 comment on dit la préscolaire euh, cours d'initiation parce que c'est à eux qu'il faut inculquer. Uh, 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 ces choses-là. And these are, should start already with preschoolers uh, to teach eux. them these things. Parce que c'est eux l'avenir. Because they are the future. Et si on ne le fait pas, on va retomber encore dans les mêmes... Uh, And if uh, we don't do it, we'll go again through uh, the same crisis. Thank you. Uh, just to add to that, uh, and... Uh, again, to that question around technology as well as, as tolerance, I think uh, Ron, Rana has made a, a good point, like in, in the development of her app, she's thinking about how it can be also used offline. And I think that's actually quite important because many of the contexts where we're seeing education emergencies take place, we have to take into account that it's not always connected or it has connections that come and go. Um, there's quite a lot going on related to technology. <clears throat> and I would say that's um, across the board. INEE does have a task team devoted to this. It's the technology task team. Uh, with GIZ, they've published a landscape review on what's out there related to technology. And I think that would um, be helpful for, for those of you interested <clears throat> in seeing what's happening related to technology. As well, though, I often say in these discussions, I'm, I'm often in discussions about technology, and I also, I'm starting to sound like an old man now, because I say, well, we should also embrace the old technologies. There's actually a lot uh, over the years that we've done with radio. Um, there's a lot that's been done through <clears throat> using radio transmissions to, to get messages out there in the Ebola crisis. And another um, example of best practice that I, that I always raise is what I've seen happening um, with what UNRWA has done in, in Syria in creating a self-learning um, curriculum that is accepted by the Syrian national um, authorities there, which is allowing children to study at home or in small groups. And then UNRWA 
um, through, from Gaza actually is broadcasting out television um, teachers on television so that children can access um, video as well they're using radio and I think it's actually really interesting model um, that could be applied in many contexts where it's physically dangerous for children to get to school on the point of um, tolerance peaceful societies and peace education um, as I said earlier and I have for those of you who are interested just a, a summary of, of our many tools and resources <clears throat> and as you'll see on the back we have the Peace Education Program, which was a UNESCO, UNHCR developed curriculum. All of these tools and resources are free, could be adapted, downloaded, used how you would like. Many are in multiple languages. INEE works in French, Arabic, Spanish, Portuguese, and English. As much as possible, we try to get these uh, resources translated um, for folks. But we also, and I have to mention this, have the Conflict Sensitive <coughs> Education Pack, which is a tool, a reflection tool for governments, for practitioners and teachers to use when they're um, looking at curricular issues. And it, it actually provides you with a checklist um, to make sure that, that the curriculum actually is conflict sensitive. Actually, earlier, yesterday, Rana and I were talking about the curriculum that we've seen that in both Iraq and Syria, um, and how scary it is that so quickly um, there's this kind of curriculum machine <clears throat> producing propaganda curriculum, the story that you told about your son having to learn how to clean a gun. How does that, you know, we can't sometimes even get books to the kids in car, and all of a sudden, in a week or two, your kids have curriculum that teaches them how to clean a gun, so so that we have some work to do on, on being quicker and getting our material to car, and that tells us how when we are evaluating curricula, we need to think about this conflict sensitivity and, and how dangerous it is and, and the politics that can come into play. We have time for a few more questions, correct? Yeah. Okay, perfect, and I saw a hand way in the back, so we'll take a couple more questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much uh, for the deep insights uh, shared this afternoon in the panel. Um, my name is Oskar Eronen. I come from uh, Crisis Management Initiative, uh, CMI. And I would uh, continue um, from uh, where the chair just ended, the uh, challenges of, of uh, politicization. Um, it would be interesting to hear um, how do you see the, the role and importance of having something like a national vision um, on a positive note, in the Central African Republic, uh, there was a series of popular consultations in the prefectures and the Bangi, so-called Bangi Forum that convened not only the political leaders and, and parties uh, and the, the military um, uh, groupings uh, or the armed groupings, but also uh, broadly civil society actors, uh, a very positive thing. Um, yet there is the the, the historical and cultural uh, background of, of arbitrary borders and, and how, how does in this situation all the talk about nation and, and seeking a national vision uh, affect positively or negatively uh, educational reforms? Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Olga Shemekin. I'm from Georgia Institute of Technology. So the question is um, to Dean and Joanna, because you mentioned that there are evaluation opportunities um, and that community is interested in knowing how certain programs work and they work. And can you give an example how, let's say, academics can get involved um, in your activities? Um, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, but this question um, from the gentleman in the back was looking at in the seeking of a national vision mm -hmm. um, and that process that actually Central African Republic is going through, mm -hmm. um, how that affects education. Uh, merci. Um, je disais tout à l'heure que le gouvernement en place a bénéficié d'une adhésion qui est très populaire. 
The new government largely got elected and was very popular amongst people. Je dirais même que l'actuel président de la République a été plébiscité. The new president of the Republic was uh, really plebiscited. Je vais un peu vous brosser le contexte. Il y a eu plusieurs candidats. Et vous savez, comme toujours, dans les pays euh, sous-développés, il y a euh, le parrainage, ou encore, je vais dire, euh, l'appui euh, de certaines puissances qui se manifestent. So, Mais, um, in the context of emerging countries, uh, when you have elections and several candidates, uh, there are certain states, uh, powerful states, who are um, supporting candidates. Et le président qui est sorti de Zurn était méconnu. And the president who won the election was actually unknown. Il était méconnu. Il n'avait aucun moyen pour battre sa candidature, aucun appui, etc. Mais il a été plébiscité par le peuple. C'est pourquoi j'ai dit qu'il a bénéficié d'une très forte adhésion. So the, the president that actually got elected uh, was unknown and didn't have any uh, of these kinds of supports uh, from states uh, outside of the Central African Republic, but really was um, elected by the people. Mais en même temps qu'il a bénéficié d'une forte adhésion, il suscite beaucoup de d'attente. On pense qu'il peut faire le miracle. But because of this also, um, there are really great expectations towards him and people think that he can accomplish a miracle. Et le miracle tout de suite, hein, pas and right away. <laughs> le peuple ne peut pas comprendre. And the people tout can't suite. understand that. Alors, ce qui a, ce qui est, ce qui constitue le force actuel euh, de, de, de l'actuel gouvernement, c'est la bonne gouvernance. So the strength of this new government is good governance. C'est la tolérance zéro. It's zero tolerance. Beaucoup, beaucoup de nos fonctionnaires et même de haut cadre de l'État qui n'ont pas compris ont voulu continuer les anciennes habitudes. Tout de suite, ils ont été arrêtés. So some civil servants, even high position ones, have wanted to continue with uh, their bad habits, uh, but right away they have been stopped. Je donne un exemple. Dans les anciens régimes qui se sont succédés, quand un partenaire arrive au pays, quand un investisseur arrive au pays, il fait le tour des ministères. Chaque ministère veut qu'on lui donne sa part du gâteau. So before, uh, with previous governments, when there's uh, a funder, uh, investor, or co uh, coming to the country, uh, they visit ministries, and each ministry would like to get his share of the cake. Et le président Tchèque a mis fin à cette pratique-là. But a new president has wanted to stop this practice. Alors, étant lui-même enseignant, il a compris que l'avenir du pays, c'est dans l'école. And because himself, he's a teacher, he has understood that the future of, of the country is in education. Maintenant, je pense, c'est un problème de, de stratégie. I think it's a problem of, uh, it's a strategic problem. Et nous pensons, une de ces stratégies, c'est d'abord de compter sur nos propres forces à travers une mobilisation des ressources locales endogènes. And we think one of the strategy is to uh, mobilize all the resources we have locally. Et ensuite, chercher l'appui. And then look for support. Aujourd'hui, euh, les partenaires qui, qui sont mobilisés ou qui interviennent dans le secteur éducatif, il y a le EFCA. Amongst the partners who are uh, involved in developing the educational, educational system is, for instance, le FCA, FinCharge Aid. Aid. C'est ça en anglais. Il y a l'UNICEF. There is also UNICEF. Il y a l'Union Européenne. There is the European Union. Il y a l'Ambassade des États-Unis. The American Embassy. Il y a l'Ambassade de la France. The French Embassy. Mais ça ne suffit pas. But that's not enough. Ça ne suffit pas, tellement que les besoins sont... Immense. Because the needs are immense. Et que dans le domaine de l'éducation, 
Parce que nous continuons de croire que c'est dans ce secteur-là que le déclic doit venir, et non d'ailleurs. We still continue to think that the sparkle has to come from education, not from somewhere else. Et le déclic ne viendra pas d'en haut. Cette approche top-down là, on l'a toujours utilisée, ça ne donne rien. Il faut faire comme moi. Je, je suis vraiment très flatté, enfin flatté, attiré par euh, l'expérience finlandaise hein, où la la commune est impliquée, la commune est impliquée dans le choix même des 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 des, des enseignants. And this top-down approach is not the solution. Um, I'm very um interested by the Finnish system where uh, commune, uh, where the municipalities play a big role in uh, choosing teachers. Et par la formation de ces enseignants, des formations de qualité, parce que nous avons eu à visiter euh, l'école où les enseignants sont formés et on a vu comment ils le sont. And I'm very impressed by uh, teacher education because we visited a school where we've seen how um, teachers are uh, Trained and that's very impressive. Et comment ils sont affectés dans les écoles. And how they are then sent to different schools. Or chez nous, l'enseignant est nommé. In in my country, uh, teachers are nominated. Quand je dis nommé, ça veut dire quoi? Ça veut dire que c'est moi le ministre qui signe euh, l'arrêté, c'est-à-dire le technicien qui est dans son bureau, assis tranquillement, qui propose, et moi je signe. So there's a technician who is proposing a teacher for a position and I sign a Alors, contract. Qu'est-ce qu'on peut attendre d'un tel enseignant? So what can you expect from such a system? Il sait que il sait que sa nomination vient de d'en haut. Donc <laughs> pas <laughs> Donc la 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 la, la communauté la, la société civile, les populations, les élèves c'est rien pour lui. Excusez-moi les termes, mais en fait c'est ça. So the, the teacher knows that uh, he has been appointed from above and also it means that society, children, parents, it doesn't mean anything to him. Et nous sommes conscients que on peut pas calquer le modèle finlandais, c'est pas possible. We know that we can't directly um, copy and implement the Finnish model. Mais au moins trouver des éléments qui peut, euh, des éléments, s'ils sont exploités, pourront quand même impulser une dynamique dans le système éducatif de notre pays. Mais nous espérons que nous pouvons prendre quelques éléments qui, si ils sont implémentés, pourraient impulser une nouvelle dynamique dans le système system de notre pays. Alors maintenant, ces éléments, c'est quoi Est-ce que est, ce sont les enseignants euh, C'est le programme euh, Now I'm not sure what these elements are. Uh, is it the teachers? Is it the curriculum? C'est la méthode qui est utilisée ou bien les trois à la fois? Bon, is on ne sait pas. On est en train de réfléchir. Or maybe the three of them. We are thinking of of it. Of it. On est fini. Yes, I'm I'm ready. Thank you for that. And just just to add to that, I think you know if we took this question even to a broader level, the politicization of education. And I think it's something as, as we work in this field, we are constantly faced with um, speaking from experience in different settings, trying to figure out how to implement education without being basically, uh, the example that comes to mind is actually uh, Northern Uganda, when the government was actually trying to push Um, the building of schools to move the population. And as a community at the time of, of NGO actors, um, we actually were able to say, wait a second, we need to make a stand here. Um, and the cluster at that time, the education coordination came together and we held um, focus groups with the community. And talking to the communities said, we have a school to build Where do you want that to be built? And the community said, we want this built in these different locations. They didn't want it built where the government wanted it at the time. And so in that case, we were actually able to go to the communities to find the answer. And actually, if you look at, at good practice, the minimum standards for education, this is what we find, that one of the foundational standards for education emergencies is community participation. And that same approach I've seen NGOs use uh, when dealing with 
the curriculum in Syria on the border, for example, um, where schools were under rebel groups, curriculum was there, NGOs did not know what which curriculum to purchase for the schools, um, and actually finding the solution by going to the communities and the schools themselves, because actually the principals and the teachers had the solution. And so I would say, you know, that's really a guiding principle for practitioners, is to go back to the communities, to talk with the communities, um, also recognizing that we um, have to also be conscious that uh, the politicization is always there and um, it's, it's, it's the part of education that we have to really um, be cautious about. Tools like conflict sensitive education, reflection tools and so forth can help us. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's something really um, it's a real challenge in our work and, and often something that um, INEE members you know, contact us as a network to help with. We don't always have the answer um, and we, we work on that together to find a solution. Um, the other question that we had um, during this round was around evaluation, opportunities. Before I answer that, I thought I would hand it over to you, yeah. Okay, so uh, you were uh asking about the evaluation and, and the possibility to work with humanitarian actors. So my previous point was that at the moment we don't have large scale and systematic tools to evaluate quality of education in emergencies programs and therefore we would really benefit from collaboration with researchers. And, and I was thinking that uh, Dean, maybe you could provide a little bit more information about that call, which is related to this research and education in emergencies. So actually, and it's connected to, to the question um, in many ways. So, you know, one thing as a network that we try to do is really to, to amplify what is happening out there. And, and in my role with INEE, <clears throat> I do get to... The beauty of it is I get to see a lot of information and, and hear about a lot of great work. Uh, so for example, earlier this week, and you can see it on our website, we held a side event with Dubai Cares on a re the launch of a research envelope for education and emergencies. Um, but at that event, we also wanted to highlight the good practice that we're hearing about and try to bring those things together related to evaluation, related to evidence. So for example, um, we invited UNESCO UIS to the event because they've actually started, um, it's just now rolling out, but it's, a, um, uh, it's an alliance to measure learning for the SDGs. And so that's like beginning. So we wanted to hear about that. We invited um, another um, US-based organization who is looking at research related to inequity in education and how inequity actually contributes to conflict. And so that was um, also highlighted during the event. Um, others were there, such as um, uh, the International Rescue Committee, uh, who's created an open source framework on evidence and research that shows good practice, and, and that's actually available. Um, so all of these different agencies were there to, to present, and the hope is that when it comes to further research, that these types of experts would be able to advise Dubai Cares as they now start to work on the design of this research envelope. Because at this point, it's an idea, and it's got a commitment of funding, but how will, we, how will Dubai Cares um, select researchers? How will they prioritize? All of those things, that's where um, we're hoping to partner with them to provide that advice, yeah. But just before I go to you, sir, um, as academics, I would really encourage you to join the network. If I had it up on the screen, I would show you it's just the click of a button. You say join, you fill out the form, you tell us your, your interests, you tell us um, why, you know, you do need to support education emergencies if you wanna join. <laughs> um, we do have a bit of a 
process where we review applications, but typically you're a member within uh, a day or two. Um, and that means you get information and you can be as engaged as you would like to be. So for the, for the question there about how to get involved, I would say please join um, and you will have the information as a result. So it's, it's quite, um, quite straightforward. Every two weeks we send updates and to our members and so forth. Um, but he had a question here, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, we. Oui, je voulais m'adresser. I'll, I'll, I'll speak in French and then in English. Je voulais uh, m'adresser uh, à Monsieur le Ministre en tant que quelqu'un qui vient qui vient d'un pays en développement aussi que l'éducation doit être adaptée par la culture locale. Uh, la, la, beaucoup de pays africains comme l'Afrique centrale n'a pas beaucoup de choses d'apprendre de la Finlande. La Finlande est tellement avance, avancée. Nous n'avons pas l'électricité, nous n'avons pas les routes, il y a beaucoup de choses que nous n'avons pas. Mais il y a des éléments qu'on peut apprendre des de, 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 de systèmes d'éducation de, 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 ici. Depuis l'indépendance, nous les Africains, nous aimons d'aller apprendre des grands pays comme la France, la Grande-Bretagne, les États-Unis, qui sont déjà trop, trop développés. Nous oublions d'apprendre des autres pays en développement, comment ils ont fait pour développer. Là où l'Afrique centrafrique se trouve, c'est mieux d'aller apprendre à des pays comme Népal et d'autres pays qui viennent de sortir de, de la guerre, même, quand, même euh, le Vietnam, Comment ils ont fait pour développer Comment ils ont fait pour se reconstruire Et maintenant, l'appui peut venir de la Finlande pour mettre en œuvre de cette expérience. So I was just saying to the minister that education has to be adapted to the local culture and to the level of development of different countries. That in Africa, we lack electricity, we lack roads, we lack so many things. And so there is very little we can like copy from Finland. We can learn from the Finnish model and from the models of developed countries, how we can adapt our own system. Um, we, since independence of many African countries in 1960, many African countries and developing countries tend to go for development experience and to copy from already developed countries like France, the USA, Western Europe, and so on. Instead of copying from other countries that are in the state of development, it would be better for a country like Central African Republic, which is really in a very poor shape, to copy from other countries like Nepal and other countries that have emerged from situations of war, destruction, how they manage to redevelop and to rebuild their uh, education system. Uh, and after doing this, they can get support to reconstruct from the developed countries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to ask uh, that we actually are now um, at the end of our time. So I'd like to actually ask if each of our panelists might have um, one last thing they'd like to share with the group. And, and maybe, Minister, you could respond to that last statement in your closing. Okay. Merci, Monsieur le Moderateur. Um, mais en fait, ça, c'est une autocritique de vous et de nous, de nous tous. This is an utter critic about, about us and about everyone. Parce que le, le problème, c'est que nous avons adopté des curricula, des programmes scolaires calqués d'ailleurs. Because the problem is that we have adopted a curriculum uh, that is taken from somewhere else. Prenez le cas de mon pays. Aujourd'hui, vous vous retrouvez avec des cadres qui ont des grands diplômes, hein? de grands diplômes, doctorat de ceci, doctorat de cela, etc. Like in my country, for instance, we have a curricula for a big diplomas that have been copied from somewhere else. Et en bas, 
En bas de l'échelle, il n'y a rien. But uh, for other diplomas, there's nothing. À tel enseigne que aujourd'hui, quand un opérateur économique veut faire des réalisations, quand il conçoit un bâtiment, par exemple, il doit aller chercher des ouvriers spécialisés ailleurs. So, for instance, today, when a company wants to build a building, uh, then they don't find uh, manpower; they have to find them from somewhere else. Et c'est ces catégories-là qui font le développement d'un pays. But these categories of people are uh, really uh, important to the development of a country. Or nous, on a fait le contraire. And we did the contrary. On a mis l'accent sur la formation théorique. Et après, un, un cadre, uh, un étudiant, après son cursus, a des problèmes pour trouver uh, un emploi. We emphasize theoretical education, but uh, students like these have problems to find a job after their studies. Et deuxièmement, vous allez remarquer que dans les discours de nous autres hommes politiques, on met toujours l'accent sur l'existence de nos richesses. And you will notice that in speeches of uh, politicians like, like que me, nous sommes riches, nous avons le pétrole, nous avons le diamant, nous avons l'or, nous avons ceci, nous avons cela. We Mais, always uh, put the emphasis on the fact that we have resources, we have gold, we have diamonds, etc. Ça, ça endort le peuple. But le problème, c'est des... But this is making, uh, the people Il faut trouver passive. de voir pour sortir ces richesses-là, les valoriser, leur donner une valeur ajoutée. We need to be able to find added value Mais à travers la formation. And this is, this can be done through training. À travers la formation. Pourquoi j'ai dit que c'est c'est vraiment une une autocritique de nous tous. Tous so nous sommes. That's why I'm saying this is an, autocr an autocritic of uh, us all. Nous sommes auteurs euh, complices peut-être de ces choses. Mais c'est vrai que c'est vrai que aussi il faut tenir compte du du rapport de force, hein? du rapport de force au niveau politique, euh, au niveau militaire, au niveau stratégique. Je ne veux pas entrer dans les détails pour ne pas faire un cours de sociologie But politique. Il y a beaucoup d'enjeux. Il y a beaucoup d'enjeux, mais au moins, au moins, au niveau de l'éducation, on avait quand même le choix d'adapter le programme aux réalités de nos pays, comme vous l'avez si bien euh, démontré. But in terms of the educational system, we had the choice to adapt it to the realities of our countries. Thank you. And uh, Rana, did you have a final word? I could say, uh, best according uh, to my knowledge, the camps were uh, organized by many uh, humanitarian response according uh, uh, according action of among others like UNICEF, Red Cross uh, and unfortunately is not uh, the funding is not enough maybe um, many of them and more to help this re uh, refugee camp yeah. with uh, ho hope to get many help and funding in this area yeah, yeah. yeah. no it's true it's, it's not just the funding it's the Uh, the yeah. coordination, it's all of those those pieces. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And one last thing. Okay, thank you. So uh, now we have been talking a lot about challenges and problems. We have heard that there are big problems in Central African Republic and a lot of challenges in Nepal. But, uh, but what I would like to emphasize still is that Or what I would like to remind is that there are also many positive things in these countries. For example, in Nepal, all the people are still respected, children are polite, and children are respecting their cultural traditions. So I think that when we plan education in emergencies programs, we can become successful if we also remember that there are many, many positive things in these countries as well. So to conclude, just to say one thing we say often in our work, um, that education in emergencies is also a window of opportunity. And it's a window of opportunity to build back better. And that's why we have these tools and resources. That's why we invest in teachers. That's why we consult with the communities. Um, and I want to thank our panelists and the organizers for today. Um, And I know it's Friday night and people would like to go home. So thank you very much. <laughs>